Karen, that was uh, a very glowing introduction for us both. Uh, thank you all, everyone, for, for inviting us back. Uh, I, I spoke, as Karen mentioned, in 2013 about the um, Consumer Insurance Act, and uh, that, this is kind of the next stage of that, is dealing more with the commercial insurances. Just a, a brief background, I'm Michael Howard, I'm a fellow of the Insurance Institute, I'm uh, an insurance partner in Brown Jacobson, I'm joined by another partner of mine from the Manchester office, uh, Nicola Evans. We are, are both in, in partners in the insurance practice, a brief rundown of Brown Jacobson, it's a national firm, we've got five offices, we've been in Manchester for uh, three and a half years now, we've got about 400 lawyers and about uh, 100 insurance partners. So uh, today we're talking about the Insurance Act, and um, we, we would say that this has uh, just come on the books. It received royal assent in February 2015. It's coming into force in August 2016, so you might be asking, why on earth are we talking about this now when it's such a long way away? Well, um, we're talking about it now because it raises some fundamental changes to insurance law. Uh, they, they are, the, the, the insurance environment or the framework within which we'd all, we've all been working for the last 250 years is basically going to be changed, uh, turned on its head. Because of that, the changes that will be made, we need adequate time to consider what the implications of the Act will be and to prepare for it. Because we need to bear in mind that August 2016 is, is only one insur insurance cycle away for many of your insurances. We've also heard that a number of insurance companies say that their policy is already Insurance Act compliant. And I've heard anecdotally that uh, some claims teams are also adjusting claims as if they were in accordance with the Insurance Act. So for the rest of us, um, it's time to catch up. The content of today's talk, we're going to be looking at the changes to the statutory framework some of the remedies that are available because there's been a significant change in what insurers can do. Um, we are identifying some problem areas and Nick will be dealing with warranties and some pr practical considerations for policy renewals to make it a bit more relevant to you. Now, uh, before we actually get into the Act itself, I think it's useful to remind ourselves what the, the current uh, insurance environment is. Um, I'm sure that you don't want to have a history lesson on, on, a, on a Tuesday morning, but um, the majority of insurance law was, uh, was being comprised or consolidated in the Marine, Marine Insurance Act of 1906. Now, the, the word marine is a bit of a misnomer. It actually applies to all insurances. But that, that is the fund, foundation, really, um, where we've had the, the, the foundation for the insurance law over the last 109 years. Now, that act has been uh, changed slightly over the last uh, few decades with case law, which has brought it a little bit up to date. But um, there, there has been a recognition that the Marine Insurance Act is rather biased in favour of insurers rather than insureds. Because of that, that recognition, consultations have been ongoing. Now, there's actually been a number of different consultations that have been undertaken over the years and decades. The most recent one, which has actually uh, produced this act, started in 2011. So it's taken four years to get, actually get this on the statute books. We don't do things very quickly in the law, as you can tell. But part of the consultation came to the, uh, produce the Consumer Insurance Act, which uh, many of you may, may have heard me speak here in 2013, and thank you for inviting me back. Um, but we've now moved on away from consumer into the, the general insurance, which is what we're talking about now. So why reform? The Law Commission uh, stated its objectives here as to try and ensure there's a better exchange of information between insureds and insurers. The reason for that was to try and ensure that there were, the, the number of disputes that arose between the parties were reduced. Um, and, and that, as I say here, is to avoid disruption between an insured and an insurer. Importantly, they want to reduce the number of claims rejected. And I think that's, that's very important because there was a 2010 AMIC survey where they found that a 
third of their members had experienced um, an insurance dispute over non-disclosure in the preceding five years. And indeed, one in 20 AMIC uh, um, members had had to litigate over the non-disclosure point. So it, it seemed as though there had been a recognition in the market that uh, insurers were willing to take more coverage points than perhaps they might have been in the past. So the intention of the Law Commission was to increase confidence in the insurance sector, both, as I say here, domestically and internationally. And I think the international aspect is particularly important because uh, we're using this as a platform to ensure that there is a, a, uh, a recognised insured um, or, or balanced uh, uh, position in the insurance market in the UK because the UK will come under increasing threats from overseas uh, markets and I think that Solvency 2 uh, will potentially have an impact. So it's being used as a platform to try and even matters out. I know Solvency 2, everyone's been talking about it for 10 years, but in fact it is coming into force next year. So what does the Act actually cover? Well, the, the Act covers um, what's called a duty of fair presentation. We're doing away with the uh, the duty of utmost good faith. It also touches on warranties, which Nicola will come on to and explain. There's an ability to contract out of the Act for, for many potentially lar larger insureds. And it also touches upon fraud. So let's, let's have a quick look at, at the current position so we can see how it's changing. Utmost good faith, for those of you here in 2013 might have remember me talking about a, a, a fault in, in Sumatra. Well, I won't go and remind you about that. But in effect, the, the key aspect here is this statement from Lord Mansfield in 1766, where he says, good faith forbids either party by concealing what he privately knows to draw the other into a bargain from his ignorance of that fact and his believing the contrary. Now, that statement has been transformed into the, the duty of utmost good faith, where, in effect, the, the insured knows everything and the insurer nothing. Now, um, that is the foundation principle for many insurance contracts. Everybody's heard of utmost good faith. What's important with the new Act is that it's removing insurers' ability to avoid policies for breach of that very duty. So... Lord Mansfield, a very clever barrister back in 1766, in fact, he established most of the commercial law that we, we operate in today. 250 years that that, uh, that duty has been in place, and that's being abolished by, by the Act. So what's it being replaced with? Well, there is this duty of fair presentation, but... What we've got, the, the current position here says that, and this is in the Marine Insurance Act, says an insured must disclose every material circumstance which it ought to know in the ordinary course of its business. Material circumstances being described as one that would influence judgment of a prudent insurer. Now, um, if there was a, a breach of that, then the insurer's remedy is avoidance. But I think that the issue that we have here, and this is where it's perhaps more insurer-friendly than insured-friendly, is that um, the man in the street, your clients, your insurers, don't necessarily know what might influence the judgment of a prudent insurer. The, the, uh, the, the issue here is that they have been, or insurers have been relying on the broker to explain to them precisely what information should be disclosed. And that places a broker at risk to ensure that they've obtained all the information from an insured. We've all seen uh, um, emails with footers saying, you know, you must disclose everything. If you're unsure, please speak to your broker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because the, 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 the issue with this avoidance remedy is that it can only be described, apologies for the picture, as, as the nuclear option, because there was only one remedy available, and that is to avoid the policy. Now, avoidance is a, is a very stringent, or it's a kind of an outrageous. Uh, um, ability to have, because in effect it, it says the policy never even existed. It was cancelled ab initio. So therefore, the premium is due to, to be returned back to the client. Um, the, the client has absolutely no cover. Now, 
Um, you can tell that that's not a particularly insured friendly position to take, to say that there, there is absolutely no cover whatsoever. Especially when you look at the fact that, that non-disclosure may have been uh, unknown, uh, it may not have been relevant to the loss, it may have been entirely innocent. So you can see that there's, there's a very, very uh, heavy burden on insureds to make underwriters aware of absolutely everything that's relevant to their risk when in fact they don't know what the insurer might, might, might need, bearing in mind the insurer is the professional and the insured is the man in the street. I'm sure many of you have seen um, lawyers being instructed to review policy coverage when you get large claims come through. Often insurers instruct law firms like ourselves to, to review all the paperwork to see exactly how the risk was placed. And then if we find, and we often do, hold my hand up, you know, I've written the avoidance letters myself, where um, you, you find something which you say, well, that should have influenced, or that would have influenced the reasonable underwriter. And then suddenly, you're, the, the insured has got no, no cover whatsoever. In effect, it, it has operated for many years as almost a uh, get-out-of-jail free card for insurers. So... Instead of this uh, duty of, of disclosure, what we've got is a duty of fair presentation, which this new act introduces. What it does is it, it places a burden on insured. It's a kind of qualified uh, disclosure obligation now, where um, you need to disclose material circumstance which are known or ought to be known by senior management or those responsible for arranging insurance following what's determined as a reasonable search. Now, I know that, that Nicola will come on to that later on about what a reasonable search would do, but it's undefined in the Act at the moment. Again, it says here, circumstances material, if it would influence the judgment of a prudent insurer. Now, that's a very similar test to under the Marine Insurance Act. But then it goes on that a presentation has got to be made in a way that's reasonably clear and accessible. So this is relevant to insurance brokers here to make sure that you're, you're making a, a reasonably fair presentation. But interestingly, it doesn't need to be a complete presentation because uh, a fair presentation can include putting an insurer on notice that they should be obliged to make further inquiries. So you can see there's been a slight shift here away from the insured knowing everything, the insurer knowing nothing to the insurer being obliged to make a more active involvement in the, the insurance negotiations to try and understand a little bit more about what the, the, uh, the insured does. You know, I think that's only fair, to be honest, because back in 1906, we weren't we didn't have access to the amount of information that we have available today. Now with the internet, most insurers are likely to have uh, web pages which describe exactly what they do. You're gonna have a list of locations so you can identify very simply with Google Maps, you'd know exactly where all your clients' premises are, you know what they do, you probably know whether they're on a floodplain, what their geology is underneath. You probably even know what the CEO have for breakfast because you know, if he's there on Twitter or whatever, he's probably got a, a picture of his cornflakes. But the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Act is recognising the, the fact that, that there is far more information available to both parties now and it wants insurers to be slightly more engaged in this renewal process. Now, now we've got over the presentation, or what amounts to a fair presentation, it's very important to recognise what remedies are available to insurers, because this has been a fundamental change, to, to be honest. And it's probably one of the most important aspects, because bear in mind, historically, the, the only option available to insurers was to cancel the policy ab initio, the, the nuclear option. It also wants to place a slight burden on an insured, where if they made a fraudulent or reckless representation, um, they can lose their premium. If you bear in mind that if you cancel policy ab initio, as if it was never there, 
you have to return the premium. In effect, the insured almost had nothing to lose by, by making a fraudulent representation. But now, uh, they're also at risk of losing their premium. In addition, where there are negligent uh, presentations made, which is likely to be the majority of them, then they have introduced, the Act introduces what we call uh, proportionate remedies. Now, proportionate remedies, we think, are going to be a very interesting area because um, there, there, there's, a, there's a number of different factors involved here. For example, if the insurer could claim that uh, it was, it would have charged an increased premium, then it's entitled to reduce the, the claim proportionately in proportion to the amount of additional premium that it would have charged. Now that could have uh, a massive, massively de detrimental effect for smaller risks, where a relatively minor increase in premium could have a significant reduction um, in, in any claims that are being made against it. In addition, there's an opportunity for insurers to, to claim that if they had written a policy on different terms, then the claim will be considered as if those, those terms were incorporated within the policy. The issue is how can insurers demonstrate that they would have charged a different premium or what terms they would have applied. Now, what we've been advising our insurer clients is that they would need to have uh, a more in-depth um, analysis in their underwriting guides uh, because, in essence, what you would need to do is to try and envisage most scenarios in order that you've got evidence to say, well, have we known that, uh, that they stored stock in the basement, that we'd have had a stillage warranty or whatever? Um, and then you could apply that stillage warranty in, for example. So we, we think that, that, that there will be, or I think there will probably be in the next 18 months, an, a rash of additional underwriting guides coming through to those of you that hold the pen. This, this is just a, a brief flowchart, really, to talk about uh, what happens in the event of an unfair presentation. I think the copies of these slides will be circulated. But, in effect, you start at the middle in the uh, rectangular box. Was it deliberate or reckless um, breach of duty? Yes, we can avoid retain the premium. If it wasn't, well, you ask, would the insurer have entered the contract anyway? No, well, you can avoid the policy and return the premium. So avoidance has been watered down. It's still there. It's still able to do it. But more likely, you'd say, well, yes, we would have done it, but we would have done it on different terms. Well, if it was a different premium, you can reduce the claim down. If you'd applied different terms, then you'd treat as if the policy had incorporated those terms. So we go back to the stated objective of the Law Commission to try and reduce the number of conflicts between insureds and insurers. Um, they were saying they wanted to see less avoidance and less coverage disputes. Well, we think there are likely to be far less uh, avoidance because an insurer has now got a full armory of, of, um, of remedies available to it in the event it's discovered that there was a non-disclosure. But you can see an opportunity here for insurers to take this as an opportunity to, to uh, retrospectively underwrite risks where they would say, well, had I known this, then I would have imposed this condition, or I'd have imposed that rate. And as I say, right of avoidance has been watered down, although not extinguished. But the Act is also slightly unclear about subsequent claims. It only refers to the claim. Now, I suppose, and I've been thinking about this, that um, if you were a broker and you recognised that your client's policy uh, was subject to uh, an allegation that uh, it was an unfair presentation, then, and uh, terms would be applied, either additional premium or whatever. What you would probably do is you would cancel mid-term, you would re-quote uh, re for that business based on the full information that you've got available now. So I can probably see, if, in, if insurers engage these proportionate remedies, for brokers to really think and say, actually, what we need to be doing is starting afresh and, and produce a new policy on, on different terms. So 
just briefly, uh, we've got fair presentation. Well, it needs to be clear and accessible, as I mentioned earlier. Interestingly, we think that, that if you data dump, if you, if you have uh, a big wadge, two inches or five centimetres in, in the modern age, um, of paper, then insurers could argue that that wasn't fair. It's not down to an insurer to wade through swathes of, of paperwork. It needs to be a fair presentation. And uh, term reasonable search, undefined, Nicola will come on to that. I think for brokers, you've got to be clear that your clients uh, need to understand that there is these changes to the different remedies that are now available. And in particular, this reduction in claims payments, which I think could have a, a, a very interesting effect. It's kind of um, an adverse average. Um, and this possibility of insurers taking more coverage points. Now, I just want to quickly run through a case study to, just so you can try and, try and see how it might engage, uh, that this act might engage in a particular scenario. Um, what we've got here, we've got ABC buying uh, PPL insurance. It's disclosed that it's got turnover of 20 million. Uh, charged a premium of 20,000. Bargain, I hear you say. Anyway, um, third party claim is made. You've determined liability at half a million. Now, what we've got here is, is the uh, adjusters might go along, have a look, and they will say, well, actually, turnover wasn't 20 million, it was actually 40 million. So, so what would happen? Well, the new act, insurers would consider, based upon all the information that they've got available now, which would include the increased turnover. So had the duty of fair presentation been complied with, they'd have say, say something like, well, actually it was 40 million uh, turnover, so therefore the premium would be 40,000, assuming a flat rate. So therefore the 500,000 uh, pound claim would be managed down to 250,000. It's quite a big reduction on any view. That's quite extreme, but it's there to demonstrate the, uh, the, the, the way in which the Act is envisaged it will work. Now, there are issues here. Um, saying here about the, the, 100, 000, the additional claim in the same year. And I think, uh, as I was saying earlier, I've been thinking about it, and I think the brokers would be starting afresh because in all likelihood uh, the, the same issues would arise with managing uh, that claim. But on, on for example, a, uh, a property policy, I was thinking about, well, well, average conditions, is it really necessary to have an, an average condition when you've got this proportion of remedy available to you? Now, initially I thought, well, maybe you don't need average conditions at all because you've got the ability to, to raise a proportion of remedy approach. And indeed, would you be in a position to apply both the average condition and the proportionate remedy on the basis that you'd had uh, an under-disclosure on a sum insured? Well, I think possibly you could. Um, I think TCF would probably engage to say, well, actually, you can't and you shouldn't. I don't think insurers would be, be minded to apply two sets of remedies. But then I was thinking, well, if you had a combined policy, um, well, then you've got, got various sections, each having uh, different premiums attributed to it and therefore there's a there's a possibility here that um, that actually you would still need to retain that average condition because if, if say the property section was a minor the, the premium attributed to property was a minor section of that property of that policy sorry that uh, you, you would need it would be unfairly biased in favor of an insured so you might actually need to retain the average condition so I think well, what I would say is that there are a number of questions that, that, that these raise, uh, in our minds at least, how insurers will interpret the, these proportionate remedies that are being introduced by this Act. And so I'll leave you with those thoughts and I'll pass over to, to Nicola. Portraying this as being all doom and gloom, and I'm afraid my next section of the talk probably isn't going to help any further on that, to be perfectly honest. Um, there are a number of practical matters that need to be considered in the renewal process, and of course we're now only one renewal away from the Insurance Act applying, so it's important that policyholders, brokers and insurers are all aware of the implications of the Act and um, what steps they need to take. Um, 
The Act envisages a very open, active process between the parties, so lots and lots of dialogue. Um, I was at Bieber recently, and I don't know how many of you are at Bieber, but I sense quite um, a lot of mistrust between insurers and brokers as to how this would play off and a little bit of tribalism about how it would all work out. Um, whereas, actually, what we need here is full debate between all parties to, um, to take this matter forward properly. Um, as Mike has already said, and I'm going to raise here, there are a number of grey areas in this Act, and of course the last thing any of you need is to be the test case in this area, because there's only, um, well, probably a couple of lawyers in this room who may well benefit from that kind of thing. And whilst I'm grateful for the business, I'd rather that you avoided it. Um, so, um, if we look first of all at um, the insured, uh, so far in terms of the Act, everybody has said how, how much better the situation is going to be for the policyholder. But there are still a number of hoops that insureds need to um, go through, and effectively that's the process that needs to start now because that's the front end of the process. Um, so, first of all, we have to look at who plays a significant role in the business in terms of who we should be approaching to provide that information. Um, in the Act, as Mike said. Um, so where do we start? Well, in a small company, we could start with the board, and that probably would suffice. But in a larger organisation or an organisation that has subsidiary companies, who do you go to? And again, that has to be a matter of dialogue and knowing your clients. So again, for brokers, I would say, think about your company, think about the structure, who you need to go to. Um, where you're looking at larger companies you need to look at the different types of insurance help because again it may not be the same individual who, who deals with things like the public liability directors and officers or the um, business interruption policies also you may need to look to external sources such as a company's advisors or where they um, outsource certain matters so again think about that pool of people that you need to go to in order to get this information Boards also need to think about their internal procedures. Again, this is something you may want, wish to alert insureds to because it's just going to make your job easier. I know this, this might sound counterintuitive by saying, can you go and educate the policyholders? But it should make the entire process an awful lot easier. So again, what we need is the internal records to demonstrate who is responsible for the provision of which information. We probably need Mike to do his nice little structure charts to, show, to demonstrate that. Um, reporting lines need to be set up so that we know that the relevant information is going into the relevant people um, to make sure that all proper information is being disclosed. Um, the other thing about setting up that kind of procedure is that you can, we don't, again, reasonable search is not defined, but the only way that we're ever going to satisfy, for instance, the courts, in the, if this comes to court, that reasonable searches have been made is to have that documentation in place and to make sure that you've got the proper procedures. So, very dull, but absolutely needs doing. The other thing I would say is um, we're looking at a new regime, so don't make any assumptions about what insurers may or may not know, what documentation they may, not, they may or may not have on their file at this time. Treat it as a clean sheet and, and just move forward. Um, as Mike's already said, um, there should be no data dumping. It sounds like a reasonable suggestion, doesn't it? If you're a policyholder, I need to give my insurers all this information, so I tell you what, I'll set up a data room, I'll put everything in there and go over to you guys. And again, that's just not acceptable. Um, information and documentation has to be provided in a clear and accessible fashion. So again, what I would um, suggest is that brokers and insureds work together to make sure the information and documentation is presented in the best fashion. Um, well, without going into the detail or, or quoting cases from the um, 17th century, um, what we, we do know is that the broker acts as the insured's agent. And therefore, as a general rule, the broker's knowledge is the insured's knowledge. And therefore, brokers need to be careful when they pick up information about a business, for instance, as a placing or servicing broker, where they might, may actually have more information to hand than the person they are dealing with in the company, who might be new to the company, doesn't know everything about the company. So the broker may actually have more information than the person who's meant to be instructing them under the Act. 
Um, remember, that knowledge will bind everyone. Um, if there is a broken firm, just again be um, aware that that is subject to the reasonable search criteria that we mentioned earlier. Um, so what I would suggest is that brokers work with insureds in terms of how the information ought to be provided, by whom, and what is going to constitute a reasonable search. The more that you get those definitions in place, the less likelihood there is going to be of, of litigation going forward. Um, now, <laughs> here's the danger alert for um, brokers, as we've seen over recent years. Um, an increase in professional negligence claims against brokers and one of the reasons that we do see that claims come through is, is as a result of failures in the buying process. So um, again the Act gives brokers a very good reason to go back and look at its internal procedures. Um, again at the risk of telling a grandmother how to suck eggs. Um, first recommendation is a simple one, allow extra time for the first renewal under the new regime. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, some I'll come back to later on in terms of the insurer, but it's so that you get to know you're insured better and you have got these procedures in place. Um, the risks and duties which attach to the policy holder should be set out to them. Again, think about things like your key facts documentation. Do they need reviewing? and amending um, so that the new legislation is referred to. Um, game brokers need to think about the information and documentation which will be given to them by their insureds. Uh, it's important to keep a record of the information and uh, have a way of storing the documentation. How is this going to be done? I, I mean, I did a case just over 12 months ago where we were trying to tell the judge how things were done in London in um, around 2000 and when we were suggesting that a lot of the deal had been done in the pub wasn't actually reported because everybody knew what was going on the judge just looked incredulous just did not understand how, how that could possibly be done or work in fact um, also um, where brokers are responsible for policy wordings or have white label products again those need a full review do they comply with the Act? And in particular, brokers need to be alert as to whether or not there are disadvantageous clauses which need to be brought to the attention of the insured. Back to the reason for that a little bit later on. Looking again at broker and insurer, again, the secret is communication. The smoother the process, less likelihood there is of litigation. Um, again, what I would recommend is that insurers and brokers start a dialogue as to what is expected during the, the renewal process. You, brokers need to establish what insurers want to see as part of the presentation process. That's both in terms of the submissions themselves, but also in terms of the documentation that um, they require to see. Um, it's also important to set a timetable because, as I say, you need a longer lead-in period because you may be seeing new wordings from insurers. You need time to acquaint yourselves with new wordings, possibly go elsewhere for different wordings. Um, we anticipate that there will be a big market variation in terms. So, again, give yourself plenty of time to do that. Um, there may also be more questions first time round as the new system beds in. Um, and as Mike's already said, some... Uh, insurers are saying that they are compliant with the Act already, but it would be just prudent to make inquiries on that. Um, 
The other thing is that, um, it's the lawyers again, they just get everywhere, don't they? Um, we understand that a number of insurers have taken legal advice on the new law and a range of responses have been given and any cursory search using my friend Google confirms that the, that's the case. Lots of law firms offering different views on different areas here. So again, what I would um, anticipate is that there will be a degree of market variation in terms of what is going to be required as a presentation. So just be aware of that. It's, it's going to be an awful lot of work. Um, and again, just at the end there, just review Tobers and um, LAs and look at where the risks and liabilities lie, make amendments as needs be. And moving over to the insurers. Um, insurers need to look at their internal procedures and they need to establish what information they have, know or ought to know about the risk and then look at what steps are being taken to gather information and how that is going to be recorded because again it's setting up this document trail. Um, what lines of communication are there to ensure that the information needed gets to the right person? Um, and again Mike and I were just having a brief discussion before where you might have an underwriter in London who definitely doesn't un underwrite this type of risk and somebody else up in Leeds who does. And um, again, at Biba, brokers were talking about, well, obviously I would just go to the, the broker in, in Leeds. So again, we need to have a think about how that's all going to fit in here. Go on to, to look at um, warranties. I just wanted to briefly um, have a look at basis of contracts contract clauses. Um, these were previously allowed um, and we have the situation currently where insurance representations can be turned into warranties. Um, some concern in the courts about, how, about that and where the courts have sometimes tried to take um, a more benevolent line towards insureds feeling that it's a little bit unfair on them and that of course in turn leads to uncertainty. So what's happened now is under the Act Business insureds will be placed in the same situation as consumer insureds and there will be a general ban on basis of contract clauses. Um, also, in relation to this, under the Act, there can be no contracting out of this provision um, whatsoever. Um, contracting out is something I'm, I'm going to come back to in, in a little while. Moving on to warranties, one of the most important sections of the Act and marks a major change in the law. Um, under the current law, an insurer can avoid all claims from date of breach, regardless of how trivial the breach or whether the breach of warranty actually relates to the claim itself. And again, we've sometimes seen the court try to rework the situation where they feel that the policyholder has been badly treated. Um, and of course, we also see the situation where insurers take the view that commercially it is better to try and settle off a claim um, because of the nature of the client. And again, that leads to general uncertainty. So the um, Law Commission reported that um, there ought to be changes and recommended the, the um, abolishment of the base of the contract clauses and where a warranty has been breached the insurer's liability should be suspended rather than discharged. And therefore, where a breach has been remedied before loss, the insurer should be brought back on risk. So going forward, a breach of warranty will no longer terminate the policy and there is a suspension of liability. If the breach is remedied, then liability resumes. There is a caveat. If something happens in the suspended period which relates to the loss, then the insurer does not need to meet the claim. Um, it might be worthwhile just looking at just um, a few examples. So um, if we use one that comes up regularly, which is um, a burglar alarm, um, whether it works, whether it's installed, whatever. So scenario one, there is a warranty in a contract of insurance that a burglar alarm needs to be inspected every three months. The insured actually inspects after four months. So there is a suspension of liability in, the, in that situation for a month. If we look at scenario two, there is a flood at the insured's premises, but when the loss is investigated, it is discovered that there is no um, burglar alarm and the insurers can't use the fact there is no burglar alarm as a reason not to pay the claim relating to flood loss. Scenario three, one for the litigators. 
Um, there is a failure to have a functioning burglar alarm. There is a theft at the premises, and it's thought to be an inside job. That one, at the moment, seems to be a bit of a grey area, and I don't know, Mike, if you have any thoughts on that one. I, I take the view that the courts would probably go in favour of policyholder, but I've, I've seen um, opinions expressed both ways on that one. Um, so again, given that there are grey areas, litigation is expensive, you don't want to be the test case, um, my recommendation would be to have dialogue with um, insurers on the question of warranties and um, also in terms of insurers, what I would recommend is that um, if you are looking at, at making things a warranty, what you should do is set out what that warranty is, which is the obvious point, but what risk of loss it relates to and the consequences of, of not complying. Uh, going forward, um, if parties don't clarify um, the situation between themselves, what I can see is insurers taking a harder stance on this issue. Um, and I think that there's also a greater likelihood of claims taking longer to resolve if, if they are disputed. Fraudulent claims. Effectively, the, the Act codifies the current law, but um, it's probably useful just to take a quick um, look. There's no definition of fraud in the Act, but it's effectively the elephant in the room. You all know one if you see one. Um, insurers will be liable for claims up to the date of the fraudulent act. However, insurers do not need to pay for claims from the date of the fraudulent act. And the insurer can also claim back any monies paid to the insured arising out of the fraudulent act. The insurer may terminate the contract by giving notice to the insured whether or not the premium is refunded to the insured is at the insurer's discretion. If insurers do decide to terminate because of the fraudulent act, there is no obligation to pay legitimate claims made after the date of the fraudulent act. Acting out. Let's finish on um, one of the most complicated areas. Um, this is likely to generate a lot of comment and potentially litigation. And the difficulty is until we start seeing the documentation coming out from insurers, uh, we, we won't be able to take a full view on, on what's going to happen here. Um, so under the Act, insurers may contract out of the new law. Uh, this can be done by insurers seeking to introduce more onerous terms or, or as they're known in the Act as disadvantageous terms. Contracting out can only occur where the contracting party is a business insured. It can't happen at all in a, in a consumer setting. And as I said previously, it can't apply to a basis of contract clause. Um, there's two conditions to be fulfilled if an insurer wishes to impose a disadvantageous term. The term must be clear and um, unambiguous. Um, just get my words out. Unambiguous. And secondly, it must be drawn to the insured's attention. And all of this, of course, must be done pre-contract. Uh, there's also, um, just to add a little bit of... Um, a sliding scale depending on the sophistication of the particular insured. Um, so therefore you need to exercise more care where it's a direct sale between an insurer to um, an insured. Um, whereas there'd be more leniency if it was a sophisticated customer buying cover at Lloyd's or where there's an unsophisticated buyer who uses the broker, again the broker on the hook potentially in that situation if it all goes wrong. So uh, it doesn't matter how disadvantageous the term is. The, um, there must be a notification either to the insured or to the broker agent. And if it's a direct sale, then the insurers must raise these matters with the insured. So again, any insurers doing online business need to be very careful that there are adequate um, warnings in place there. Um, now, if a broker is involved, again, brokers on the hook, potentially. There's an assumption that the brokers know the state of the law in the area. Um, therefore, the term may not need to be explicitly, um, it may not be explicitly said that, that there's contracting out. A broker would be expected to read what's going on, understand that there is an attempt to contract out, and then bring that to the attention of the insured. 
Um, so a clause that's clear and unambiguous could be said for put, putting the broker on notice. If the broker does not pass information onto the insured and there is a subsequent claim that's not met, then again, broker on the hook. And insurers need to make sure that the terms are clear and unambiguous in order to avoid litigation. There's also um, TCF that needs to be considered in that respect. So again, I can foresee some litigation coming out of that. Um, the other thing to remember is FOSS can hear complaints involving businesses with turnover up to £2 million and fewer than 10 employees and certain commentators are suggesting that we can um, expect to see consumer type awards in the event of a reference being made to FOSS. Um, so again, um, repeating myself, um, this is an area where brokers and insurers need to have an early dialogue and establish what is the appetite in the market for contracting out and is it likely to be standard? And are insurers likely to take a common stance in terms of how they flag up the sections of the policy they are seeking to contract out of? Now, my view at the moment, bearing in mind that insurers are going to different lawyers to advise them on these terms, is that it won't be standard. So brokers are going to have to be very alert to spotting the different terms between the different policies. So, again, we can see the Act is bringing in far-reaching implications for all concerned, particularly, I'm afraid, if you're a broker. So early dialogue is the key to try and avoid falling into the pitfalls or facing claims. Mike and I are willing to take or we're hanging around for a while at the end if you want to come and chat to us or if you're a broker have a go at the lawyers for introducing these changes thank you